So she co-founded Punctum magazine. Punctum. 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 Yeah. A publication devoted to promoting contemporary Asian photography. And she's one of the founders of GoaPhoto.in, a national photography festival which will be held in Benjamin, uh, Goa, uh, very soon. And uh, Mr. Rao is a founding managing editor of Muse India, a very impressive e journal that showcases Indian writing in English and uh, Indian languages literature in translation. Uh, he's also one of the directors of Hyderabad Literary Festival, which was started as an initiative of Muse India. He's author of Meghamitra and other poems. That's a collection of poems, The Lock at the Gate, short stories, and Krishna Deva Raya, a historical biography. Sunita is uh, she's Sydney-based, but she is presently living at uh, in Goa at Kuttori. She writes uh, fiction, plays, uh, novella is in progress. She also does fiction editing. And she runs Mascara.com, a multicultural literary magazine. Venka Shivdasani is the author of two collections of poetry, with the third one. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> third one, sorry. The three collections of poetry. Uh, she's also the co-translator of Freedom and Fishers, an anthology of Sindhi partition poetry published by Sahitya Kathmi. She has edited an online anthology of contemporary Indian writing for bigbridge.org, a literary e-zine in the United States. She's also the editor of Sparrow's If the Loop Leaks, Let It Be, a volume of writing by Indian women launched in Singapore. Her work has been featured in various anthologies. Uh, today, we will speak put forth on their experiences in publishing little magazines of high literary quality, both on the in the print media as well as online. We'll have around 15 minutes of discussion and then let's have an interactive session so that we can all share our aspirations to publish. In the democratic world today, uh, we all have dreams of what you are doing, of doing what you are doing. Not found it necessary. The 
the last 10 years, we have reached a readership, we have registered membership of more than 6,000 from 45 countries. News India is exclusively devoted to Indian literature. Not only writing in Indian English, <coughs> but all the regional languages of the country, but in a translated form. It's a bi monthly. We bring focus on one particular regional language with every issue. Incidentally, we have also covered Konkani language some time ago. Maybe, maybe <coughs> eight or ten months ago, we have covered Konkani language. We have not only covered all the major languages of the country, we have covered several minor languages. The main strength of a web journal that I see is its enormous reach, its global reach. We cut across all frontiers. It overcomes the immediate problem of distribution. We don't have to worry about physical distribution. Some promotion is required. Most of our promotion has happened through the word of mouth. But some promotion and some marketing is required. But there's hardly any effort towards physical distribution. The entire distribution happens on the internet. So that's not an issue at all. So these are some of the advantages that we looked at when we started. And it has grown well. Today we have 20,000 hits every month on News India site, which I would imagine is much more than many of the Indian print magazines can take. I don't think Indian magazines, literary magazines, I'm talking of literary magazines, I'm not talking of India Today or Film Facts, I'm talking of literary magazines. I don't think any Indian literary magazine has that kind of readership. So that was my experience of starting a little journal, little magazine on the web has been a fine kind. Today there are several others, even though we started 10 years ago and we were one of the five years. Today there are so many other literary magazines on there. The other ones that I can think of is Kritya, which is a bilingual magazine. We have the founder editor of Kritya also in this uh, in this literary festival. This is uh, and there are several others. I would not like to name all, but all of them have been doing well. But let's also hear the experience of uh, the other other panelists here. Some of them are in print version, some of them are in web journals. Zola, we like to. Hello. Uh, well, my experience is a little bit different, I must say, from Mr. Rao. I have started two Indian magazines. Uh, the first one was a commission by the Embassy of Spain in Delhi. Um, I brought a copy. It's not little, I'm afraid. Um, this was... Um, it was a, a very interesting project because it was fully uh, state-funded. Um, uh, it had its shortcomings mostly in uh, distribution, uh, but it was my first magazine, and uh, and I think that that's where I started interacting with photography and trying to uh, make photography, um, um, I, trying to create a dialogue between photography and literature. But as I said, the distribution was a problem because we could not sell it. This was a, a Spanish government funded project and this became a big issue. We, all, we could only give it to by hand, no? So it's, it's a very strange project because you cannot judge it by the market, you know? It's, it's, it's like it's in, a, in another universe. Um, when the, pro the funding finishes, the ambassador came, the ambassador went, the project stopped. But I'm very glad I did this for three issues, for three years. Um, the, this, with this I started um, like a passion for photography that developed in another publication, independent, it's called Pankton. And we've made four issues so far. And this was done by a group of three people. Um, it was relatively easy, I think. 
Uh, I think it's relatively easy to start a magazine. The problem is how to sustain it. So we had to uh, get funding, be very creative with the funding. First, uh, an Asian organization, then the British Council, then the Japan Foundation. It's, it was very, very challenging um, and still is. So I don't know if I agree with the title of Golden Age for Little Magazines because I think it's very, very difficult to, to survive. Uh, but I mean, I, in a way, the, the price we pay for being an independent publication, which is a luxury, I think, to be able to be fully independent, to, to dis define the contents, to be uh, free from advertisements. So, I mean, I think it's been a wonderful experience, but I, I have to disagree with the, the adjective golden because no, it's not our case. Um, I, I, I brought the objects because even if we had, for example, for Puntum, we have an on, we have a website. The magazine is online. Our focus has always been the object, and it's like some kind of fetishism. But if I could not bring a print-out version, I would never do it. You know, many people over the years we've, we've been telling about our economic problems, etc. And many people say, ah, why don't you go only for an online version? But for me that has no interest at all. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not uh, an object and it's not, uh, it's not sexy in a way I mean, to do an online publication. And there is so much uh, good photography online. I think looking at photography requires a different media. I think the paper is the best. I, I think it's very, very difficult to fully appreciate photography uh, in, a, in a computer screen, even if I had to do it because I didn't. I've learned by going online, no? And that's how I've seen most of uh, photography. But then if you compare it with the experience of seeing a book going through the pages, it, the, the order is very important also then if you are talking about a narrative. So in our case, had there not been a printed version, we would not have been interested at all. So well, we can continue this conversation. Thank you, Lola. I think the point that Lola makes is very important because I still see a certain amount of ambivalence towards you know, being published in an online forum as opposed to the printed page. Now your printed page may have maybe 100 bios if it's a poetry book or 200 or 500, it may not go beyond that. But people will still want to see their name in print. There is still a certain validation involved there, which I... I found this when I edited an online anthology of contemporary Indian poetry. This was for an American design which has been around for 16 years. So it's not like it's a flash in the pan thing that you know people don't take seriously. It is a very solid, serious publication called bigbridge.org. It's an arts and cultural uh, magazine brought out online by a poet called Michael Rothenberg. And, uh, when he asked me to do this anthology, of course being paid for it was out of the question because they have no money. And you know, literary magazines don't have money, unfortunately. Whether they are online or whether they are in print. And um, I agreed to do it. And people sent me their poems. But there was that question, okay, it's appeared online, but uh, when is the print version coming out? And I said, sorry to disappoint you, there's not going to be a print version. Then there'd be the silence. And uh, I'd say, but you know, the, the advantages of being online is that you have a much larger audience. And you do have the credibility of an e sign that has been around for 16 years. So, you know, it's not something to take lightly. But there was that little bit of disappointment. And I did speak to Heman Vifte of Poetry Vana just before coming here and I asked him, uh, would you bring out a print version of this anthology? And he said, you know, at least he is very passionate about poetry. He will, he will do whatever needs to be done to promote it. But he said that if we do a, a print version of something that's online, no one's going to buy it because it's out there, you know. 
Having said that, I think it is also, you know, the, the, the number, you know, Mrs. Rao talked about the 20,000 hits that they get. I had the privilege of being interviewed by News India and I know how much that mattered to me as a poet who comes from essentially a print medium, you know, and uh, because it was something that I could share online with people who mattered to me across the world. And people whom I didn't know at all recognized me through that interview and knew about my work in ways that they would not have had otherwise, you know, access to. So I think, I think we've now reached a stage where internet is gaining the credibility that it did not have 15 years ago. What was happening was that the moment people realized they could publish poetry online or any, anything literary online, they would just put it out there without any thought to quality. Whereas what's happening today is that there is quality involved, there is the same editorial rigor that a print magazine would involve. It's not that you can just put out something and uh, expect to be accepted. It's not going to happen. And it's, uh, that's the way things should be. You know, I, I come from uh, an environment where little magazines and literary magazines were very important to me as a young poet. I was 16 in the 1970s, when mid-70s when I started to write. It was very important to be published in a magazine like the Indian Pen, for example, something like this, which was how many pages? 38, 40 pages. This is the 1992 version, so this is much later, but magazines like that gave you the information about what was happening in the literary world, which today you get through Facebook and you get immediately, but in those days it was important. And it was also, uh, you know, something that gave you the first platform as a writer, which which then stays with you for many years after you know, it's first been published. I think both of them still do have their uh, their advantages. If you're talking about the golden age of literary magazines or little magazines, I would say that no, I don't think this is the golden age, not yet. But uh, I do think that the web has been a very good thing to have happened to the literary world. And I do think that it is something that uh, should be encouraged by writers who believe in quality. And uh, I'm really glad to see that such magazines do exist. In those days, a lot of our movements, a lot of our big names today are with Krishna Mirotra, Mr. Ezekiel. These were the people who started their lives with little magazines. And we wouldn't know of them today if they hadn't done that way back when, you know, they, they, they had the passion to bring it out. And that passion is something that I'm happy to see being carried over into the, into the online world through websites that promote literature output but I would be concerned about quality and I would hope that that quality is maintained as we go forward and uh, because websites are so much easier to do than print so I'm really happy that we are at this stage I do think there is space for both and I do think we should allow print magazines to survive in spite of all the distribution problems, in spite of every other you know, issue that plagues such publications. But I think there's, there's a way to find a balance. Um, I um, do a bit of fiction editing, so I have a very small role in actively creating um, making um, a literary magazine. I fiction edit for a, a publication, it's an online journal in Australia called mascara.com. It's a journal that was founded, it was a brainchild of another poet, Australian going poet called Michelle Kyle. I think she's come to this festival previously. And um, it's a multicultural magazine and she had been very passionate about including more voices in the um, quite a well-represented range of literary journals there are in Australia. 
but they're primarily print. And um, her focus had been bringing greater attention to uh, Asian, South, Southeast Asian, subcontinental and indigenous writing. But it's now become a forum um, and it's something of which she should really take the credit um, uh, for very high quality writing and it's a sought after journal. One of the things I was concerned about when she approached me um, was that it was online and I am someone who is a print person and um, I've come around to the notion that we have, I mean, it's now inevitable that one embraces uh, online as the format that uh, has reach and um, scope and it makes it very, from a technical point of view, I think it makes it, I don't know what the processes are because I've actually not worked on a journal on an ongoing capacity that's a print based one, but technically my the work I do editing becomes much easier because of the format um, that we use for mascara, the online format. Um, I'm just trying to think of what angle I can <laughs> take to kind of um, bring some things into focus. In Australia we have a number of fantastic journals, so I'll just name a few of them. Um, Southerly's one from the University of Sydney that's very, very good. Um, the Angens, another very well regarded one, University of Melbourne. There are some recent uh, uh, excellent non-fiction uh, journals that have um, come into the, into the landscape. So um, Griffith Review is a one that's um, also very good for, it make, there are people writing terrific essays about the environment the political landscape in Australia. So we're not, um, and there are many, many more journals that I've mentioned, we're not, um, there's no, at, at this time in Australia, there are people buying, you know, print journals, but um, they struggle also with funding and this kind of constant struggle with, you know, uh, I think recently our, our funding body that's, the Australia Council, our National Arts Funding Body, um, has enabled uh, journals to uh, apply for five year long uh, grants so that they can be supported because it's primarily through government funding that these uh, journals can exist. They don't really have um, a any other um, way of supporting themselves. Um, so five year funding is much better than say triennial funding because it allows them to know that they've got um, such a long period in which they can develop an agenda for whatever the, the uh, fiction or other um, other work that they want to present in the in the future will be. Um, I don't know whether I should add anything.